Carmen Pinos, uh, she is today 67 years old. She was born in 1954. Um, an intense uh, lady and uh, an excellent uh, architect and, and, and designer and a very serious, um, that's why I, I sent in my um, uh, invitation a picture with her having in the background and also uh, near her uh, on that sofa or, or even bed, uh, lots of books. Um, so, but this she shares with Benedetta Taliabue, she also has a lot it's possible that uh, Eric Miraes himself also loved books. This is her website. So you can, you can visit her website and, and study if you want her works more in detail, cpianos.com. So she is based in uh, Barcelona. She studied at the same school where her uh, ex-husband studied, uh, the uh, School of Architecture in Barcelona. And uh, they had uh, a very interesting beginning in architecture, and we are going to see in detail one of the most important works by them, uh, a cemetery near Barcelona, which is quite a remarkable uh, architectural work. I think we need to celebrate more and more women in architecture because there aren't too many, and I think uh, there is a dramatic change, actually, even now in the schools of architecture, not just in Romania, but everywhere. Uh, there are more women than men. And this shows that uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, architecture is rejuvenating itself through the contribution of uh, countless uh, talented women, and we welcome them. Men had their chances, uh, in many cases, uh, they didn't contribute so brilliantly to the world because of the uh, ego. Let's hope women are not going to repeat the same mistakes men made. I'm not saying that men didn't have brilliant contributions. They had, but they also made uh, their mistakes because of this uh, unending assault on the earth. But if the woman is mother earth, in a way, let's hope she is more wise than her counterpart. counterpart the man. So hello, uh, Ms. Uh, Pinos, uh, Carme Pinos. Uh, she is very famous now and she builds uh, in other cities. She even builds outside of Europe in, uh, in Mexico, for example. And um, I saw a building by her in Vienna and we are going to see that building. But this is remarkable because in the past, the woman was kind of living in the shadow of the man. That's why we had, uh, even we called the woman, Domna Doctor, which meant she was married to a doctor, or uh, Domna Engineer, which, meaning she was, she was married to an engineer, and so on. Uh, but uh, things are changed. The woman now is quite capable by herself to, to, to name a, a name for herself, so to speak, and um, you know, she's not living any longer or, you know, in, 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 in many cases, perhaps she's not living any longer in the shadow of her husband. And she's not stay home. She's working just like the husband um, outside of the home. And sometimes they contribute and they work together. And I think uh, in this case, they did some, some excellent work herself together with um, uh, Eric Miraes. Uh, I, I just at the beginning, I show a few images of her work uh, um, that she did individually, and then we'll, we'll study them uh, in detail. As you can see, she's adventurous, she's not inhibited, and she's not inhibiting. Uh, she's a free lady who thinks courageously, and I, I, I say the same thing all the time, every day. Be courageous, take risks, express yourself, don't work in a timid way. Creativity is not about timidity, it's about taking risks, it's about being courageous, and uh, uh, there is no other way. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, analyze these works in detail, some uh, uh, pieces of uh, furniture that she designed The 
a good architect can do uh, a lot of things, not just buildings, but also urbanism, even landscape architecture or gardening, uh, object uh, design or uh, industrial design. Please be kind and turn off the mic. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Unless you want to say something. So these are works he did after, um, uh, you know, breaking apart, so to speak, from her, from her husband. She is uh, um, here in her office. Quite an unusual uh, sight, really, because uh, in the in a certain past, not too long ago, it was very unusual to see a, a lady uh, run an, an architecture office and an architecture office which is uh, quite active. Here they are. On the left, Eric Miraes. On the right, Carme Pinos as young people. And in the space, in the back, you see a drawing of that uh, quite important architectural work, uh, the cemetery I, talk, I told you about, which was built near uh, Barcelona. The Igualada Cemetery in Barcelona, it is said, but it's actually near Barcelona. And I consider it as important for architecture as uh, uh, Brion Cemetery by Carlos Carpa. In my opinion, the two best works built at, at the end, well, in the second half and the end of the 20th century uh, in, in this field, so to speak. Uh, this is uh, usually Carme Pinos uh, accompanies her project with a, um, uh, uh, how to say, it, you know, it's an um, ideogram in a way that expresses the, the in, in a few lines, uh, the, 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 the formal uh, essence of the project. And this is what she did for this particular project. So as part of a competition to replace an older cemetery, Eric Miraes and Carme Pinos envisioned a new type of cemetery that began to consider those that were laid to rest as well as the families that still remained. After 10 years of construction, the Igualada Cemetery outside of Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain, was completed in 1994 as a place of reflection and memories. It is a very, I didn't visit it, but uh, let's hope if the pandemic goes away, you can uh, arrive in, uh, in Barcelona and not forget to visit this uh, memorable, but very modest uh, architectural work, which is not trying to embellish death or idealize it. Is, is, uh, this project is looking at death straight in its eyes, so to speak, and, uh, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a, a project that, uh, that um, tries to evoke, uh, you know, the, the end of life, perhaps without too many illusions, but, but because uh, uh, beauty, I think there is beauty here because there is poetry, but it's not a sweet beauty. It's, it's not about sweetness. It's not about illusions. It's about uh, the, the truth of life and the truth of death. And, uh, um, you know, uh, when they did this project, uh, I'm sure um, uh, Eric Miraes didn't know he will, he will die young. He died of a uh, brain tumor. Uh, so um, anyway, the Igualada Cemetery is a project that challenges the traditional notions of what makes a cemetery. Miraes and Pinos conceptualized the poetic ideas of a cemetery for the visitors to begin to understand and accept the cycle of life as a link between the past, the present, and the future. It's understood by the architects to be a city of the dead, where the dead and the living are brought to closer together in spirit. As much as the Igualada Cemetery is a place for those to be laid to rest, it is a place for those to come and reflect in the solitude and serenity of the Catalonian landscape. Um, you know, some people might think it is a depressing place. Um, it depends. It depends how you perceive 
what is here. It's done with the simplest means, but in terms of architecture, it's quite uh, uh, sensitive and, and uh, I would say uh, even uh, sophisticated. It's a creative work, no doubt. And I think this, uh, this project uh, is a brilliant uh, example of, uh, of an architecture which is not uh, comfortably uh, sitting in, a, in the realm of, uh, of the predictable. It's, uh, it's also a project which shows that with simple means, uh, even with austerity, uh, sometimes you can, uh, you can achieve uh, poetry. Uh, in architecture. Look at the beauty of the plan. It's, it's not really the plan of a building. It's, it's, it's the plan of an organism which is uh, composed as, of various layers. Landscape, fragments of buildings. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a journey. It's a journey that takes place within this. It's almost like the silhouette of a human being, the site plan. Is it not with the head here and, 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 and the body? And it's, it's walking within this uh, uh, metaphysical uh, human body, which is actually the, the, the side plan of, of this uh, uh, remarkable uh, um, uh, cemetery they built. I had the chance to attend a, a lecture by Eric Miraes in New York City. Uh, I remember him saying that in Spain, uh, architecture is usually horizontal. And I remember me asking him if, what about Sagrada Familia, which is vertical? And he said that, yes, there are exceptions and Sagrada Familia was one of them is one of them, but usually uh, architecture in, in Spain, now this is Catalonia, but it's still part of Spain, uh, is, is horizontal. Uh, I, I like very much what I see here, you know, it's, it's again, it's an architecture which is not uh, meant to comfort in a pleasing way and in a, in a, in a misleading way, actually, no. It, 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 it's an architecture which is uh, attempting to testify about the gravity of death, but is uh, because of beauty, and I think there is beauty here, uh, the, that gravity is actually transcended because uh, beauty transcends, I would say, uh, 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 even, uh, even gravity. Now, why are these uh, shards if I can call them so on the on the floor uh, uh, on, on the slab uh, well because in a way they represent perhaps the you know the uh, fate itself you know no one knows when one will will have to say goodbye in this life and uh, uh, you know it's it's um, there is a level of disorientation, but this disorientation is because you are you are accepting that life uh, is uh, is uh, beyond our will. The human will is very uh, sometimes uh, uh, self confident, but that that self confidence is not always uh, or often it is not uh, very legitimate or justifiable. Le Corbusier was very fond of the straight line to the, to the target, to the goal. And he dismissed the donkey. He made fun of the donkey. He said that the, the donkey is uh, zigzagging while uh, the will of man is going straight to what man wants to achieve. Well, paradoxically, when he was older, he wanted to erect a monument for that very donkey he was making fun of the zigzagging donkey. He wanted to build such a monument. He didn't build it, but he wanted to build it in India. Um, I mean, even here, what we see, it's, 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 uh, you know, it makes it, it makes you stop and think, what is life? What is death? What is a hole in the ground? What is that slab that is uh, uh, accentuating the descent?
And please note that there is no makeup here. There are no makeup artists. And I don't think a good architect is about uh, uh, doing makeups. No, no, it's, 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 it's about the truth of life. And uh, you might not like the truth of life as you see it here, but uh, uh, I think honesty is always to be appreciated. I think they collaborated very well, and I regret they they uh, they broke off, so to speak. And it's possible that happened because the younger Benedetta Taliabue was hired in their office, and uh, I guess uh, Eric Miraes fell in love with Benedetta, and Benedetta fell in love with him, and there it was, the, the usual story. And Carmen Pinos was uh, <laughs> kind of left behind. I don't know what happened between them, but perhaps a book could be written one day, uh, Carme, Eric, Benedetta. A very strange and interesting uh, uh, triangle, if I can call it so, within the field of architecture. Three architects, all of them, all three of them brilliant. Uh, La Villa Olimpica, 1992 in Barcelona. Uh, the, this uh, pergolas are very, very interesting and very dramatic. Look at them. Look at what they built. Carmen Pinos and Eric Miraes. Again, the bourgeois and the timid would say, no way, I will not have this. But um, again, the Olympics are about conflict, about uh, it's a competition. And what we see here, we see conflict. And uh, there is a drama. Who knows? Maybe Eric Miraes had uh, uh, a certain turbulence in his mind and in his soul. And uh, this express that turbulence uh, quite uh, dramatically in a sculptural way. Uh, but I think they are memorable. They are, they are the, po the most uh, expressive pergolas uh, probably in the history of architecture. They are expressionistic, they are, uh, uh, yes, they are uh, uh, tormented and tormenting, but uh, uh, they are memorable. Who would have thought of building such pergolas? They are creations, they are expressions. It's the artistic side of the architect that allow uh, itself to, to, to be externalized. But they're more alive than the buildings left and right. Now, uh, Carmen Pinos and uh, Eric Miraes, they were not deconstructivists per se, although they worked around at the same time, but I wouldn't, they appear to be deconstructivists and, and to an extent they are, or they were, but there is, beyond the fragmentation, which would um, connect them with a deconstructivist movement, there is also a certain quest for a certain organicity that, that, that the deconstructivists didn't actually have. So there is a difference, I think, between the work of Henry Miraes and Carme Pinos and the work of, uh, of the deconstructivists. It's also remarkable that the city of Barcelona built something like this in conjunction with the Olympics that took, took place there. This shows that Barcelona is a very uh, mature on one hand, but also <clears throat> adventurous city in the field of architecture and in the field of aesthetics. <clears throat> and of course, in the field of culture. But let's not forget, Antoni Gaudi was from there. So <clears throat> there were precedents. In a way, <clears throat> what Albert Einstein said that creativity is contagious, pass it on. Well, that's what Antoni Gaudi did. He passed it on and the, the, there were other remarkable architects in Barcelona. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a city that, that nourishes itself continuously with this uh, 
constant invitation to uh, creativity and exploration and experiment. So this is a work done by Eric Miraes and Carmen Pinos, or Carmen Pinos and Eric Miraes, when they were partners in life and in architecture. Now this was done by, um, uh, you know, a little bit later, pedestrian footbridge in uh, uh, Petrera, Alicante. I think the work was built later, perhaps on a, on a, on a project that they started together. I don't know. It's a newer work uh, somehow, and uh, there is a difference between what we see here and what we saw in the previous example. Uh, there is a movement and there is a certain level of sculpturalness, but it's not as uh, uh, angst infused uh, like the, the pergolas in Barcelona. But even here we see these locations, you know, uh, um, of course, the one who likes comfort uh, wouldn't accept this easily. But this is also a reminder of uh, the great end, so to speak. Or is it an end? We don't know. But it's, it's uh, and, and this is being done uh, these days uh, by other architects. But uh, they did it uh, at a time when not too many people thought of, uh, you know, uh, having such uh, interventions on a surface which usually was supposed to be uh, you know continuous and rather smooth without interruptions or disruptions but the the disruptive side of architecture i think is uh, important sometimes peter eisenman even saw that only a disruptive architecture is one that truly moves you maybe there is some truth there i don't know Although I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so so sure. You know, there are architectures which are architectures which are not disruptive, and one cannot contest uh, the uh, significance. But let's not forget, Peter Eisenman was a, a deconstructivist when he made this statement. Another sketch by uh, Carmen Pinos, as she usually makes for each project. And here is the plan. It, it, it's an architecture of, of shards, of fragments scattered on, on, on the land. Now, this uh, seafront in Torre Vieja, um, uh, this is done by uh, Carmen Pinos, uh, I think without Eric Miraes. It's truly remarkable that uh, both Carmen Pinos and Benedetta Taliabue, not only that they continued the activity they had with their husband, Eric Miraes, but they actually uh, uh, grew uh, uh, both in quantity of works and quality. Uh, so th they developed. It was, it's a very interesting case, I think. And both of them. Now we see her at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, opening the summer show. And I hope when the schools of architecture in Romania will open, we'll also have the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the density of, of, of such gatherings. Uh, we should have, like them, exhibitions <clears throat> that are challenging, that people are running towards and uh, with students and, and, uh, and, uh, and professors uh, being uh, thirsty to, 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 to look at uh, creative works. And this is what we see here. Uh, and she opened this uh, exhibition. I, I don't know in what year at, at Bartlett, a very important school as you probably know in London. 
<clears throat> now uh, a master plan for the historic center. I hope I have images here. No, I don't. I knew there was something about this. The department <clears throat> building of the new campus of the Vienna University of Economics and Business in Austria. This building I saw is right next to a building by <clears throat> Zaha Hadid. And I have to say, although it's less dramatic, in terms of architectural quality is not inferior to the building by Zaha. Uh, Zaha building is right here uh, next to it. I hope I have an image with, with both. So this is in Vienna, in Austria. And uh, across this space on the left, there is a building by uh, a former dean of Bartlett, um, uh, uh, who is himself an interesting and important architect, Peter Cook. So in close proximity, you have here Peter Cook, Carmen Pinos, and on the right, uh, Zaha Hadid. Here we see the building by Zaha, which is a library. This is the one by Carmen Pinos. Again, this corner here belongs to the Zaha building, and these are by Carme Pinos. You see how she did the openings. The openings, uh, meaning windows in the wall, they, they, they create an ornamental pattern on the facade. So ornament, again, is not totally to be banished from architecture. In fact, in fact, I don't think we can banish it. We need both structure and ornament. I mean, the, the will of the architect here is uh, rather ornamental. You know, these, these openings have an ornamental nature. We have to escape the determinism, the, the stubbornness of uh, the functionalist view where you have uh, poles or columns and beams and that they need to be expressed at literum in the, in the, in the facades. We have much, uh, much larger, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 there, is, there are many possibilities to, to, to make a building uh, statically or structurally functionable and also to have a, a, a freedom to, to operate with, a, with the elevations of the building that are not strictly uh, rationalistic. Here we see the three architectures. So here is Peter Cook and here is Zaha Hadid and this is Carmen Pinos. This building is also remarkable. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I do not remember the name of the architects, but uh, there, is, there is good architecture here. So Zaha Hadid, Peter Cook, and Carmen Pinos. <clears throat> you can understand that she is in a, in a very challenging uh, you know, vicinity with neighbors like uh, Zaha Hadid and uh, Peter Cook. Although I admire Zaha Hadid, <clears throat> I have to say uh, this building, which was admired by the students I went with to, to, to visit it, <clears throat> the building actually inside could have been anything. You know, it doesn't, it didn't communicate in any way that it was a library. Uh, so I would say this was and is a problem with Zaha sometimes. Now we go to Mexico, to Mexico in uh, Guadalajara, where she built two towers. We look at cube one and then uh, tower two, two. I don't know if it's still called, uh, if it's still called a cube. Uh, this is more of a cube than the other one, but it's, 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 a, it's an excellent building. <clears throat> Guadalajara uh, has uh, some very innovative architecture 
and even some very tall buildings. Uh, we are going to see some of them. So this was built by Carmen Pinos. Uh, you see the facade is woven, is uh, textured, is uh, almost, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a textile work. It's almost like a fabric, no? So this is a work which she built by herself without any mirrors. But we look at the plan, at the site plan and the plan of the building and we see the same uh, dynamic architecture. <clears throat> and uh, I would say even tumultuousness. So this is the cube one that we just saw images of. We are going to see also cube two. Cube two tower in Guadalajara, uh, it's uh, a building which is very different from uh, the previous one. And yet you can see it's, it's, it's about the same architect. This one is, is taller and more slender but it's still a, a dynamic, uh, dynamic architecture, sculptural, sculpturally engaging. So this is a different kind of country that uh, ex-president Trump tried to depict uh, Mexico being, you know, a, a, you know, this is a culture uh, that is uh, complex, uh, sophisticated, rich. There are important architects who built and build in Guadalajara. And, uh, you know, the description in Hollywood movies of uh, Mexico or Mexico is not, is not quite accurate. It's not a country of uh, just uh, thieves and uh, drug dealers, uh, crime and so on, no. I have been in Mexico and I have to tell you, I met very proud people and very uh, uh, sophisticated uh, who never thought of leaving Mexico. Uh, but uh, the movies coming from Hollywood uh, depict a different kind of Mexico. It's not, it, they certainly don't depict something like this. So this is the building by uh, Carmen Pinos. Even Tadawando built in, uh, in, in Mexico. I imagine this tower was built by a man or a group of men, I imagine this tower was built by a man or a group of men, I imagine this tower was built by a man or a group of men, but this tower was built by a woman, by a lady. And bravo to her. And it's taller 
than the other buildings. Not that architecture is about dimensions, but it shows the big change within the field of, uh, of architecture and culture in general. The woman is more and more creatively present and his, she has a lot to offer and we better acknowledge it. And actually her building is more creative than the others uh, in the vicinity of her building. This is a, a building that was not built yet, also in Vienna. Now, this is uh, interesting that both her and Benedetta Taliabue built uh, um, or, 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 or contributed to a refurbishment, a restoration of uh, an existing market, an urban market within the field of Barcelona. This is the work by uh, Carme Pinos, again, uh, expressing the conflict and, uh, and the drama of this conflict. Uh, which is engaging. Uh, so, you know, between these buildings here, you have a market which is dynamic. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a good choice. It is different from the market that uh, uh, Benedetta Taliabue uh, built. We are going to see that market, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. But this is by Carme Pinos. the power of the diagonals. The diagonals increase the dynamic quality of a building, always. Because of the, because of the exceptionalism, a diagonal is an accident, is uh, something else, so to speak. And, and, and uh, even in the city, in the, the urban tissue of Barcelona, there is an important uh, avenue called uh, the diagonal. So the diagonal is, is, is fighting with the Cartesian system and uh, it is needed as such. Here is the proud lady, Carmen Pinos, uh, the, the author of this building. Here they are again, uh, you know, the, the young uh, uh, Carmen Pinos and, and Carmen Pinos and, uh, and uh, Eric Miraes. And here she is probably in her apartment. Anyway, the cube two of his tower, which you already saw some pictures of. You see here, I don't know who designed this building, but in my opinion, it's, uh, it's mimicking drama. There is more authenticity in the more restrained drama of the building by Carmen Pinos. As for here, I don't know, it's rather a banal building. But the one by Carmen Pinos is not. What I'm trying to say here, here on the left, which is not a building designed by her, um, the so-called drama is bi-dimensional, is graphic. It's just on the surface. If you remove it, you get a, a building that is, you know, rather less interesting. But here, Carmen Pinos didn't need uh, to mimic drama or to have this kind of uh, skin bidimensionally, uh, you know, uh, tormented, so to speak. So there is more inner force, I would say, in the building by uh, Carmen Pinos. So this is cube two. It's not really a cube, but um, it is called so.
something like this would have been inconceivable, uh, you know, even at the beginning of the 20th century. A woman architect, a lady to build, you know, to build such, uh, such, you know, public buildings, institutional buildings. Oh. This is uh, the beginning of the, cons of the construction, an initial sketch. This is for cube one. This is cube two. Now a single family house in the district of Valcarca in Barcelona, again, that she built herself without any mirages. Quite a good building is this one here with uh, exposed concrete uh, in, a, uh, in a context which would have invited, uh, you know, historicists, but she refused to uh, work within the historicist, uh, uh, you know, uh, mode, and uh, I'm, I'm glad she did. It's harmony through contrast, is the modernity, the freshness, of, and the vigor of, of a building that doesn't want to mimic what is on the left and what is on the right. And it's a very good building. You have to belong to your time. You cannot, you cannot in the name of respect uh, and the mimicked uh, affection to, you, you have to be true to your time. And she was true to, and is true to, to her time. Now, these are not within the house, but uh, I, I, I show also from time to time examples of her interior design and uh, uh, object design. This is an interesting building, the Caixa Forum in Zaragoza. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a building that uh, proclaims the same sense of individuality and uh, non-conformism. Look at this. You know, it, it's a building that... Uh, that uh, uh, is advocating, uh, you know, togetherness, uh, culture acting as a, as a coagulant for, for meetings. Uh, and, and, and the building is, is, uh, has a certain level of instability, which is actually contributing to the, to the, to the ferment. And please notice again that ornament has its role in architecture. You know, uh, this is not structure, obviously. It is ornament, but the ornament is discrete uh, in a way. But although it's it's very noticeable, uh, but it exists. We should we should be aware of this. It's a good building. <clears throat> it makes me think a little bit of uh, <clears throat> with the Whitney Museum by Marcel Breuer in, in Manhattan, in New York City. At night, there are, uh, they have the ability, the building has the ability to, to uh, project uh, all kinds of images on its facades, in its opaque fa on, on its opaque facades. Now this is a, a small, a small a summer house, uh, also in uh, in uh, Guadalajara, uh, in Mexico. Uh, this building is a little bit less, uh, but maybe appropriately so. It's a private building. It's a house. It's a home. It's not uh, the 
the house of the gathering, so to speak, is not a is not a, an institutional building, is not a public building. I find it a little bit less interesting, although what is interesting is uh, her ability to to merge the interior with the exterior. So it's this continuous dialogue between the outside and the inside. It's an open house in a way. Breathing communication between what is outside of the building and what is inside the building. And being open to, to dialogue, to this dialogue, even though its dimensions are not, it's not a big house, but it achieves a level of uh, complexity which uh, increases somehow the qualitative dimensions of the building. <clears throat> what we see here is the same uh, ability that she has to uh, have uh, multiplicity in unity. We have the fragments, but the fragment, fragments reclaim themselves from a center and they together create the house and yet you recognize the fragment, you recognize uh, the, the, the unit that contributes to the whole. Now, uh, I will end this uh, introduction on, in her work because she actually did some other works. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it uh, next year if I continue this series uh, with some uh, um, object design or industrial design or furniture design that she did. You can see all her works on her website. And this is an image from, from her uh, website, just as in the case of her buildings, she has a little, uh, you know, sketch, a little vignette that, uh, you know, expresses in a way the essence of the, of the furniture she designed.
Okay, uh, on this presentation, I have also Benedetta Talia Bue, but about Benedetta Talia Bue, we'll talk not tomorrow, uh, but the day after tomorrow. Thank you, and let's wish happy birthday to uh, Carmen Pinos. Happy birthday.